We call them the tobacco station. We're going to be talking about me and my man Jeff Borsha is going to be about tobacco seeds. It's going to be about the seedlings in the greenhouses. It's going to be about transplanting those baby plants into the fields. So when it comes to tobacco seeds, there are different type of tobaccos for different type of tobacco products. You got tobaccos that are meant to be for cigarette. You got tobacco that are meant to be for shoot tobacco. You got tobacco that are meant to be for pie tobacco. And you got the best of the fucking best, <laughs> which is black tobacco for premium cigars. So what they are growing right here it is a beautiful, a special tobacco seed. When it comes to the tobacco that they have been growing in Florida, they have been growing tobacco for more than a century. Is that right? More than a century. And what Jeff did, he took, he made the decision. And he wanted to get a tobacco farm when he knew that nobody was growing tobacco right here in Florida. But speaking about Florida, I want to bring, I want everybody to give a really nice round of applause to Jeff Borshuas, he's gonna take it a beautiful journey. Oh, for your son, go to back. Okay, thank you guys. So this is our little educational part here where hopefully everybody can hear me. So um, you're standing in a field that was planted 60 days ago. Uh, the plants that we start off with are seedlings that are in, tra in trays. Some of you have been to this barn slope in the past. You actually got the plant seedlings. Um, we're so short on tobacco that I needed every square inch of this field and to be able to still get this tent in. So we're not going to plant seedlings today, but instead I'm going to show you how this all starts. So I brought these little seed heads here. Everybody, you just take a seed head off and pass it around. It's a little show and tell stuff here. But this, this planter here has these trays on it. Grab a, just grab a pot off the top. Here, fast is allowed, guys. That's a great question. It got too expensive. That's the only reason. Florida was growing great cigar tobacco, but labor is very expensive here compared to other countries. And so uh, it was just the, the economics of it. Yeah, well, I tell you what, we're only able to do it for one reason. That's because we've got the retail stores. So we're able to sell all our plants. I guess don't mind volunteering, passing some of those around. So listen, what you see out here in the peel right now, the tobacco's at a 60-day stage, right? You'll notice some of the plants have this kind of leaf structure that pop warming, and it's inside it you see a bud, okay? So that is the beginning of a flower. Now, if tobacco grows it incredibly fast if it's, if it's in the right conditions, okay? This, this uh, bud stage right now, overnight, can sometimes grow up to six inches, ow, ow, all right? Overnight, real fast. Not every plant grows at the same speed, though. If you look, I pulled this one out here, this was planted the same day as some of those plants that are five feet tall. And you notice this in like 10 inches back. Well, it's something, and either it didn't get close enough to the drip irrigation or its root just didn't make good soil contact, something happened. But that just gives you an example of when the, when the tobacco's right, it's gonna grow real fast. We planted this tobacco a little earlier in the summer than we normally would because we're, we were working from the barn smoker date back, okay? So uh, when we planted, it was super hot. It was like uh, 95 degrees where it's really, the reason why tobacco's in the nursery is called a nursery because they get taken care of like a baby, right? As soon as you go to transplant it, it's the most stressful time of its life. They said you're putting it in a field, direct sun, it gets hot. Uh, you know, it's struggling for water. It's struggling to get its roots growing. So believe it or not, because we had the plant kind of early, we lost a lot of seedlings because some of the water that comes through the drip tape was like 150 degrees as it came out. So that's just a little too hot for the little plants. So we lost a few. A lot of people ask, hey, why do you got sunflowers in the, in the field? And that's to, believe it or not, that's to replace the holes where the seedlings died. And we wanted to make it look pretty for you ones. So the, so the sunflowers are here for no other reason than to make it look pretty. And then you guys are welcome to take those sunflowers home today. You can seriously go pick whatever you want, make a little bouquet, bring it home. And then the other reason we have it, some of you had our tobacco honey that was used on some of the stuff that we had for lunch today. Um, I have a neighbor right behind us that has beehives, and uh, he raises or, or makes honey off of some of the flowers that we have here on the farm with the tobacco flowers, especially when we're done with the crop. When we're done with the crop, that plant will try and make this flower again. It's really interesting how tobacco is. It's a survivalist. It's like 
everything it does is to try and just reproduce itself. So that's why when you pick the top of this plant off, if we don't put something called sucker sign on to stop that growth from coming back, it'll grow three of these things. It, it knows it's been broken and it'll push seeds because all it's trying to do is put seeds in the ground to make more plants. Now, this is what the seed heads look like when you let the flowers go. It's a really big bouquet. And then you'll end up with this pod. And so anybody that has a pod, just pick one off. Do me a favor. I need a volunteer. I need a hand. All right. So if you take one of the seed pods, you look at the size of the seeds, they, they look like little pepper grains. Tobacco seeds are some of the smallest seeds in the world. Mustard seeds and tobacco seeds. Now, what's interesting, if I told you that, you know, like, go try to plant those in a row, you could never do it. It'd be like, you know, you just can't even see them. So that's why we send these things off to pelletize. They go from pelletize, where it's a little bigger to work with. They go in those trays right there. You drive behind the tractor. We already have the rows prepped. Here the irrigation is run. And where there's something called black plastic mulch, which helps hold the moisture in. And then we plant them one by one, uh, 30,000 plants at a time. And you repeat that process and then, you know, get it going. After, after you do that, a few of them die and you got to go back and re replant again. But that's just part of the struggle. So 60 days in it, we get into this topping stage, pull the tops, put the sucker side on it. And then starting like two days ago, we start harvesting the big leaves. Now, you're welcome to handle these leaves, touch them, try not to break them though. The leaves on good tobacco is sticky. So it gets, it, it's, it's gummy and that's what we want. When you guys look at a cigar and you see the wrapper, it's got oil and it glistens, that's that sticky gum that's on the tobacco. You want, oil, you want tobacco that's alive. When you have tobacco that has a lot of oil to it, you're going to get a lot of sheen and a lot of flavor. And if you get tobacco that's kind of like this dry and doesn't have that, they, you guys call it Spanish Brazo, right? Yeah. So they're like, oh, yeah, glass of oil. You like that, dude. And so, so when they, you know, that's what they're touching and feeling it. Because once, once we cure it, it'll still have that, especially once you, you put a little moisture to it. So this is the leaf that's ready to go. Our seed variety that we use is Cuban Corolla seed variety. Um, we found it, you know, our farm is the closest to Cuba. And we run up, it's about 110 feet above sea level here, which is what it is in Canaveral, Rio. And so Cuban Corolla seed grows best for us because we're very similar to it. So um, it tastes great. There's a drawback to using uh, Corolla seed from Cuba. It's a smaller leaf. Most of the stuff, like if you hold this up to what's done in Nicaragua and stuff, it's usually about four inches longer, which means you get more pounds per acre, which uh, when it comes to the economics of growing tobacco, somebody asks why you don't grow in Florida, that's another thing. You know, pounds per acre, the cost per pound is crazy high. But, uh, you know, that's that's not really the reason we do it. We do it to have exclusive products in the stores. So, um, Pedro, you want to add anything about the difference you guys do in Nicaragua? I will say one other thing. When you guys go to, uh, have, you, have a lot of you guys been to other bar swapers like in Connecticut, you can touch me and stuff. All right. So when you hatch the way, they're, they're, American farming for cigar tobacco is still viable if you're using stock cut methods. Okay, so stock cut is what you're going to see in Kentucky. That's what you're going to see in uh, Connecticut. And the reason they call it stock cut is they, they take like a hatchet and they chop the whole stock down. And broadleaf is called broadleaf because the leaf is huge. So one leaf of broadleaf tobacco weighs about as much as four or five of those. And with Cuban tobacco, it, it grows like a Christmas tree. If you notice, the top leaves are smaller and the bottom leaves are big. So we have to go through this field eight, nine, ten times. So our harvest generally runs about two months. You, you work through the field, pick all the big ones, come back the next week, work those same rows again, and keep that process eight or nine times. The winter crop... Uh, it's so much better to work in the wintertime because it's just not blistering hot. But every now and then you run into problems like we did this last Christmas. So this last Christmas we had a freeze. So we had 25% of the leaves that were still on the plant got frozen and couldn't use them. So we've kind of had a bad season from, you know, the loss from a freeze and the loss from a hailstorm. So now we're trying to dig ourselves out of the hole. So bottom line is um, it's, your stores are out of 20-acre farms. It's not because of them. It's because of me. We'll try it. We're, we're doing our best to get through it. But uh Hey, it's tobacco, it's, it takes a while. So uh, that's kind of the process. We'll pick these leaves, we'll put it in the bins, one by one, go through the field. And again, Connecticut is the only other place in, in the U.S. where they are still doing that. But Connecticut kind of went out of business too, just because it took too much time to sow and, and hang one leaf at a time. But broadleaf is still a very good crop for a lot of those places. No swamp is it doing good. Because again, you need a crew out here. If this was broadleaf, I could have this harvested in, in six hours. You get a crew that come in and just chop it, chop, 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 
put on the stakes, put it up in the barn, we're done. And those guys move on. So that's kind of the way it's done in, in Connecticut. Of course, they have thick fields, so it won't be done in six hours. It might be done, you know, a couple of weeks. But they got huge farms, and there's still a, there's still a, it's still a good business. But as far as Connecticut shade goes, that's why you don't see any shade on farms in Connecticut anymore. And if you do, somebody should start one up again. Somebody doesn't want to make any money out of it. The bread of Ecuador. Somebody should do it so they can at least keep it going because it is different. I'm telling you, Connecticut shade, Ecuador shade, they look the same, but they they do have a slight difference in taste. But anyway. All right, Fader, my dear brother. Absolutely. Very good, man. You know, when he calls the tobacco guys, one thing that has been the enemy of tobacco since day one is the misunderstood. So for me, it is very important when I see all of you guys right here to understand the, everything that goes behind the curtains. But everything is titled, fly my man, job set from this. Little tobacco, see, open your hand, bro. Open your hand. You ready? You see, every single one of these little guys are going to be a beautiful tobacco plant. It's right there. So for one single spoon, you got enough tobacco seed that you can come out with acres. But as I said to you guys, when it comes to black tobacco, they are five original tobacco seeds. Yeah, Nader said about the size, this is a tree. The QNC that we use, I brought back in a bare ass wind bottle, okay? And that bottle of tobacco, once it's palletized, makes about a third of a bucket of a five gallon bucket. We're still using that same seed for the last four years, okay? And I still have more. So I just tell you, like when he said that about the amount of seed there, this right here would probably produce at least a million plants. Yeah. So it's really, it's really for lifted growing plant. Sorry about that. What are you looking at? A medium plant right here. Wow. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you straight up. When it comes to the tobacco seed, every tobacco seed is going to give you a whole different variety of tobacco. I'm talking right now, black tobacco. From black tobacco, the original tobacco seed, you got Havanese that came from Cuba. You got Mata Fina that came from Brazil. You got San Andres Negro that came from Mexico. You got Sumantra tobacco seed that came from Indonesia. And then you got broad leaf that came not from Connecticut, but came from Pennsylvania. When you're growing tobacco, guys, there are different types of soil that you need to have. And this is a gift from the mother nature, because when tobacco literally uh, flourish, where there is the soil that is volcanic soil, like the soil that we got in Nicaragua, or glacier soil. Back in the days when we got the ice age, so all those elements were added to the to, to the soil right there. And every tobacco seed works different, in, not just in every country, not just in every tobacco region, not just in every tobacco farm. Because from one tobacco seed, you're going to have tall plants, short plants, big leaf, short leaf, a little white leaf, long leaf, narrow leaf, thick leaf, black Super black tobacco leaf, as well as a natural tobacco color is like Habano, you know. But everything, when it comes to that, you also have tobacco that are going to be meant to be for thinners, that are going to be meant to be for grappers. What it doesn't became a grapper, which is the best of the best, that's the revive, or the, what do you call the cut of the, of the beef? The re, 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 the re, that's. Yes, go ahead. So one of, a lot of times people ask for you bro and wrapper or filler or whatever. And one of the best, I remember asking this question, Eduardo Fernandez, one of the biggest growers in Nicaragua. He goes, Jeff, you always want to try and grow wrapper because you grow wrapper, you end up with filler. Because no leaf is going to be perfect. This one's a perfect leaf. But when you walk through there, the field, you're going to see a couple that, you know, there might have been a worm or a grasshopper that eat holes in it or the wind may tear it. And believe it or not, one of the most things, common things that damage a tobacco leaf is a person's finger. Because they're, they, 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 300 pairs of hands touch the cigar by the time you get it. Every single time that cigar is handled, even the, the guys in the retail score, you, you know, people buy, drop a box of cigars, right? Split the foot. So every single time from the time we touch it here or even walking down the roads, if you're not careful, your ass will hit one and break the leaf, right? Or if you get a windy day, it'll tear it, whatever. So every step away from the time it's in the field to the time it's harvested and hind, 
and then we pack it, and then these guys have got to unpack it, and then they got to put in their pre loans. And the thing is, when the factories where they do the loans, they got to rotate those things two, three times. Then they got to pack it, let it age, and then they're going to strip the leaves. I'm telling you, there's so much stuff. At, you start with wrapper, and, but you end up with a lot of filling. That's right. So, you know, that guys, it's a, it's a it's sacrifice. It's a decision that you're going to make, you know. But when it comes to tobacco, as Jeff was telling you guys, especially binders, wrappers, and peelers, once the tobacco is good, because what Jeff is chasing is chasing for that magic tobacco seed. A magic tobacco seed that is going to provide a healthy tobacco plant that is going to provide a better good yield. And most importantly, it's going to provide a beautiful flavor. A company like Drew Estate, where we don't grow tobacco, what we do, we work with different tobacco suppliers where we go and buy not just a couple of bells, not just a hundred bells, thousands of bells in order for us to keep existing cigar brands 100% consistent. Once you switch one half of belief, the blend that you have created, the blend that has been selling very good at your store, people are going to notice a different day is not going to taste the same as they had been enjoying that cigar for X amount of month, X amount of year, or X amount of decades. So the tobacco itself as a whole requires a lot of hard work. It requires a lot of tobacco experience. It requires a lot of techniques that you use. So if as an example, in Nicaragua, our tobacco season is start right around October, but right before October, right around July, that's when we start to work with the compost, which is the soil that goes into the seed beds. So in Nicaragua, 60% of that soil is Vega soil. Vega soil is the soil, the black new soil that you're gonna find it right next to water sources, like right next to the river. Then 20% is right shelf, plus fertilizers. And then the other 20% is sand, because you want those little baby roots to move around. So in Nicaragua, everything starts in June, I mean, in, in July, then around August, we got the compost ready to go. That's when we start to put those tobacco seeds that are going to be feelers, grappers, and binders. So right there, the tobacco or, uh, that, that we grow in Nicaragua goes in a whole different methods. Where we have a greenhouse, it could be the seed bed could be in the floor, or it could be in top of the table. We have to irrigate those baby plants because at that point, that's the most delicate stage of that tobacco. And then after 45 days, we transplant that tobacco into the fields. Now, when you are in the field, when it, what, what are the elements that the tobacco needs? Is a good weather because the tobacco literally survive with the sunshine. If it is too cloud or too rainy, the tobacco is not going to grow. If it is too much water, the tobacco is going to die with all the different tobacco diseases that affect the tobacco itself. And then the climate and everything that you said when it comes to the techniques. But one thing that these guys do, they're chasing for the magic seed. We are chasing for that beautiful, amazing tobacco that provides a beautiful flavor. And from that point on you know, in Nicaragua, as well as what Cuba does, what Dominican Republic does, like Honduras does, everybody works differently. Everybody have different tobacco seed. And Nicaragua provides the strongest tobacco, oh yeah, the strongest tobacco right here in the cigar industry. And you're starting off with the tobacco that comes from this my city, which is Esteli. The entire city is surrounded by tobacco fields. And then right in the city, you got around 65 up to 70 little, not just little, between little, medium, and big, largest cigar factories. And then you got all the tobacco region in Nicaragua, which is called Jalapa. Jalapa give you a very nice, sweet, flavorful type of tobacco where they grow ha a Habano 2000, Criollo, and Corojo. Those are the different tobacco seeds that are being extremely resistant when it comes to the tobacco disease that affect the tobacco itself. When it comes to the diseases, yes, five, all right, very good. When it comes to the different tobacco diseases, you've got blue mold and all the stuff that affect everything when you got in the field. But for us, as a true state, and you guys already know, 
We make different types of cigars from infused cigars like acid cigars, tobacco special, which is a coffee infused, to non traditional cigars like Happy Bow Wilco, like Kentucky Fire Cure, like dead wood cigars. Traditional cigars like Liga Privada, like Herrera Esteli, like Nica Rustica, like even Factory Smokes, Undercrown, 20 acre farm. Of course, and one of every single cigar that we make, our goal, guys, which is what that's when things get extremely real, is about making a blend and creating that blend for a million times. It could be if this is a mild to medium, it's gonna be a mild to medium. Medium body, medium to full, but one thing for sure, a true stay, our Liga Privada number nine doesn't take like Liga Privada T52. Liga Privada T52 doesn't take like older crown 10. Under Crown 10 doesn't take like Under Crown Maduro. Under Crown Maduro doesn't take like Nica Rustica. Nica Rustica doesn't even take like Under Crown Shade. And when it comes to in premium infused cigars that we make, those are the cigars that bring new cigar smoker into this. Okay? And one thing that I, is my biggest thing when I give a cigar, especially when I'm smoking from friends and they haven't smoked a cigar in their life, and I give them a Deadwood cigar, so I, did, I give them the acid cigars, and I see them smoking that cigar from the beginning to the end. It's a beautiful thing. My first cigar that I smoked, and I was smoking that cigar for almost two years and some month, and that one was the acid Cuba Cuban. That was an amazing cigar. It was the right cigar for my palate. But when it comes to tobacco, when it comes to cigar, it's about educating people. And that's what we are doing here. We are educating you guys. And when you get the right education experience, you're gonna have a beautiful appreciation next time that you smoke that cigar, next time that you're smoking a cigar with your friend, next time that you're smoking that cigar with your family. And one thing that a cigar does and gives it to you guys is the most unforgettable experience.